Oh dear. Oh, oh dear. That uh, that theme, I think it needs to go in for some rest and um, rehabilitation, maybe a little bit of time off. Oh dear. What do we do in the meantime? I know we've got the new theme, and a lot of people do like the new theme. But maybe um, maybe we should compromise because people have been writing in saying, please keep the old theme. But I think I have come up with a compromise. I really have. And here is, from now on, the new way to start the Skeptic Zone podcast. You're listening to Skeptoid. I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone. Richard Saunders here from Sydney, Australia. It's episode number 120 for the 4th of February 2011. On this week's show, we're going to dive into the muddy waters once again. That is power balance, placebo bands, Eakin, Fton, however they pronounce it. All these magical, mystical bits of rub with holograms stuck to them. Dr. Rachie in Dr. Rachie Reports segment is going to interview Dr. Simon Bryce from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology about their tests into power balance and their conclusions. I wonder what the conclusions were. No surprises there. Following that, we have Maynard's spooky action at a distance. Maynard's going to interview Ian Emsley, who is an optometrist. They're going to be discussing the bizarre trend of people trying to get drunk by putting vodka in their eyeballs. I kid you not, coming up. And that audio is courtesy of the ABC here in Australia. Thank you, ABC, very much. And to wrap up the show, we have an interview with Half of Melbourne. Yes, Half of Melbourne jumped onto their computers, Skyped me, and we're going to be talking about Melbourne skeptics and their skeptics in the pub. I wish I could be there right now. Now, I'd like to bring Sydney uh, listeners' attention to the Sydney 1023 mass overdose on Sunday, the 6th of February, uh, 2011. That's only a couple of days from now. We're going to be gathering at 9.30 behind the Opera House at the Choo Choo Express, that's where the little um, little uh, fun train sort of leaves from, to guzzle down copious amounts of sugar pills, otherwise known as the scam, sham, con, and outright fakery and fraud product that is homeopathy, which you can buy at about any pharmacy you like. Come and join us if you want to find out more. Head for meetup.com and search for Sydney Social Skeptics. And you can find out more about that. See you there on Sunday morning. Well, I'm going to run downstairs, grab some ice. Yes, that's my drink of choice this week is pure, solid ice because of the heat wave in Sydney. And uh, we can all enjoy the Skeptic Zone. Now it's time for Dr. Rachie Reports with Dr. Rachel Dunlop. Okay, and so we welcome now to the Skeptic Zone Dr. Simon Bryce from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Hi, Simon. Welcome to the Skeptic Zone. Hi, Rachel. Thank you very much for having us. So, Simon, can you just tell me a little bit about your academic background? Uh, well, um, myself and the other chief, chief investigator of the project, uh, Brett Gerard, were both chiropractors by trade. Um, my previous experience was also in a degree in human biology, uh, where I was on my way to becoming a microvascular physiologist before getting into uh, chiropractic as a clinical uh, background. Uh, I did um, some research at the University of Melbourne for a while as a, a what's called a, a peak red fellow, a primary healthcare research evaluation and development fellow there. Uh, I did a little bit of um, qualitative research, and uh, I think I'm still listed as an honorary fellow somewhere along the line there. Uh, then took some time off from researching to do a master's in neuroscience, which I'm still just 
tidying up the feces at the moment, um, and also do some teaching as well at um, MIT and um, a few sessional things here and there elsewhere, uh, where we educate the final year chiropractic students and um, yeah, assess their competency, etc. Okay, so so what was it that prompted you to do this study? Uh, Brett and I, as well as uh, teaching together at the university, we both practice together as well in private practice and. Uh, my special area of interest is um, neurological conditions, specifically balance and, and vestibular rehabilitative therapy, so balance rehabilitation. And Brett uh, treats a lot of elite athletes, so elite level basketballers, runners, you know, a whole bunch of other um, different athletes. And we were each getting our own sort of patient populations coming in asking about these bands repeatedly. Um, the athletes would come in and say, I'm using this, how does it work? And the balance patients would come in and say, should I get this and will it work? And um, yeah, it was just one of these phenomena that sort of crept up on us. And most of the time, these things come and go, as, as most people in clinical and, and academic fields uh, know. You know, we've got uh, magnets and copper bracelets and all different types of other metals usually. But uh, this thing just seemed to be really quite phenomenal in, in, its, uh, in its uptake in the general population. So um, we decided we had the equipment and um, we'd... Uh, have a bit of fun and, and give it a go, find out for ourselves, because we, we couldn't find anything in the in the literature anywhere, not surprisingly, and um, we thought we could design a, a project and um, and find out for ourselves. Well, that's funny you should mention that, um, Simon, because as it turns out, Power Balance couldn't find anything in the literature either when the ACCC asked them for evidence. <laughs> they said there's no scientific evidence to support our claims. Um, and, I mean, some of the claims that they make, which um, you, you do cite in your study and um, you've put into... Uh, your study is that they claim that it improves your, bal- your balance, your flexibility. Uh, it also uh, has a Mylar hologram, which is embedded with a range of frequencies that react positively with your body's energy field. They result in faster synaptic responses. I mean, as a person with a physiology background, does that make any sense to you? Uh, no, look, I think what happens with, with these sorts of things is, uh, and we did find some research on uh, what's called human frequencies, which are extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields and, and uh, their effects on human physiology. There's um, you know, a few papers out there on that that are quite well done, and this is a recognized uh, field of study in, in physics. But a lot of people try and sort of hitch their trailer to, to these mm. sorts of uh, concepts. And so it's one thing to say that there are human frequencies and that these ELF fields um, you know, affect human physiology. It's another thing to then say that what you've produced subsequently affects that and then that positively affects uh, the person so it's a big leap very big leap and um and ultimately sifting through that we we saw all the the claims and, and the mechanisms that they were claiming uh, behind it but we sort of set out to sort of have a look at the um if it worked uh, rather than the how and we thought mm-hmm. if we find there's an if then potentially later we'll concentrate on how but at the moment let's just find out if it does anything you know, and, and not to yeah. get too bogged down in the, in the potential theory, which may be, may be spot on or may be absolute rubbish. You know, who knows? Well, let's talk about the trial then. You, you did a randomised placebo-controlled trial uh, with 42 subjects. Mm-hmm. Um, now, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you set up the trial? Because you had um, a placebo um, and then you had the power balance band. Tell me what was your placebo? How did you develop that? We actually took a real power balance band and excised the hologram from it and then ground down and manufactured some stainless steel, uh, some inert stainless steel discs to the same size and weight as the holograms and replaced the uh, holograms with those, with those discs. Um, and after that, we took both the real device and the placebo device and we uh, covered them with a, a few sticky dots and turned them inside out so that people didn't know which one was which, but to hold... Uh, visually, they looked the same. To hold, they felt the same. But uh, one of the holograms was replaced. So the holograms on one were replaced with the steel discs. And so you actually concentrated on um, monitoring balance, uh, didn't you, Simon? And you used computerized dynamic um, posturography. Can you explain to our listeners how that works? Sure. Uh, it's a reasonably standardized way to measure balance in, uh, in a laboratory and in a, in a clinical setting as well. Uh, what it is, it's a fancy way of saying fancy set of scales, effectively. So people stand on a, a platform, a balanced plate, and it measures sway. So how far forward, backwards, left, right, people are uh, leaning at any given point. And, of course, in normal balance, we're all moving backwards and forwards uh, in any given direction a little bit all the time. 
And what we can do with this plate is measure that quite accurately. But also we measure people under different circumstances. So standing on the plate with their eyes open means that people are receiving information about where they are in space with all their inputs. So feedback from muscles and joints like the ankles in particular, feedback from their eyes and feedback from their inner ear balance systems. Then we can eliminate one or, or another uh, system by getting them to do simple things like close their eyes, measure them again, or stand on a foam surface, which will confuse the, the joint feedback, measure them again, or foam surface with eyes closed and measure them again. And uh, from that we get a whole bunch of data about how different people handle those different circumstances and, uh, and analyse it as such. And I think it's important to note also that the person operating that machine didn't know whether the participant had the placebo or the power balance. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. We blinded the uh, operator, which happened to be me, and um, and each group of participants, which we randomised into two groups, would go through testing one week where they were tested with the real device, nothing, and then the placebo device. Then they'd have that order reversed the following week. And then another group actually did placebo, nothing, real device, and then had that order reversed the following week. And uh, they never knew which device they were using when they had either the real or the placebo. So we can hardly wait to hear, uh, Simon, what happened? What were the results? <laughs> uh, well, as you can probably imagine, uh, there was no statistically significant difference between any of the groups across any of the uh, procedures uh, and even across time. There was a trend for people to improve uh, using, uh, sorry, the standing on the phone with their eyes closed, but everybody improved over time, which effectively means it was a learning effect. But uh, as far as using the bracelets was concerned, there was no difference between baseline and placebo. In fact, there was a little bit of a trend towards getting worse with either the placebo or the real device, but uh, again, not statistically significant. Uh, what was interesting for us is that we didn't even see a placebo effect. Normally in this sort of a uh, study, if we were asking people how they felt about their balance, we might assume that they would feel a bit better with the real or the placebo device. But because we were measuring so objectively, we didn't see any placebo effect at all. And that's because you mentioned this in your paper that you weren't asking them to report how they th thought they performed. You were just measuring their performance, right? Yep, just doing it totally uh, in a... Uh, objective, um, quantitative way using the, the measurement platform and, and the appropriate software. And, um, yeah, it didn't really worry. I mean, unless they told us they felt like they were going to puke and we'd get them a bucket. But, uh, <laughs> we we uh, didn't care about how they felt about that balance. We only measured about how we could measure it, uh, concerned about how they measure it. So you also mentioned that um, you didn't investigate some of the other claims that power balance particularly they make, which is that um, their bracelet improves strength, flexibility and endurance. Mm -hmm. But you made a comment that because the hologram seemed to have no effect on balance, you suggested that it's probably not going to have any other effects either. What, what do you say about that? Uh, look, we think it's... Um, well, I mean, partly it comes down to... Uh, we were talking about earlier the uh, potential mechanisms behind it. Um, you know, we were sort of showing that well, if it doesn't improve balance, which is quite a dynamic process that involves several different neurological and um, musculoskeletal systems coordinated all at once, then it's unlikely that uh, other things such as strength and flexibility, which ultimately can be um, even components of balance, would, um, would be affected in any way. Um, we think it's, you know, it's highly unlikely. Again, we've got to leave ourselves open and say, look, somebody needs to come along and test this stuff as well. And... Um, you know, I've got a sneaky suspicion that, um, that some of the groups want to do that, but uh, at the moment we, we think it's pretty unlikely. Well, then, based on your findings, um, in your opinion, Simon, do you think that perhaps some of the things that Power Balance claim about their product could be construed as maybe false advertising? In Australia, uh, I understand that what happened with the ACCC and uh, the Therapeutic Goods Association is that they were actually in breach of um, the Trade Practices Act because they were making therapeutic claims and hadn't actually registered the device with, as a therapeutic good. So in that regard, yes, um, they're making claims that are unsubstantiated. Um, we've gone from a situation where we've had no evidence that it did work but also no evidence that it didn't. Now we've got evidence that it doesn't. And so uh, that um, certainly, you know, changes the playing field a little bit and means that, um, you know, they certainly need to become more accountable for it now. 
Well, it's very interesting because when all the um, news came out about the ACCC uh, decision in December 2010, uh, there also is now a, a class action lawsuit um, being compiled in LA uh, in the States. Um, but Power Balance continue to claim that their product works everywhere else except in Australia. So um, do you think as a physiologist that perhaps uh, the hologram might not work upside down in the Southern Hemisphere? <laughs> well, you know, again, we, if we're talking electromagnetic fields, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who knows, maybe, uh, you know, in uh, another few thousand years, we'll, uh, we'll the, polar, the poles will flip and uh, everything, <laughs> everything will work down here and uh, <laughs> it won't work in the Northern Hemisphere. But again, uh, my knowledge of physics is uh, simple at best. <laughs> So you mentioned, Simon, that you work with sports people and obviously they're very superstitious. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that there's been a lot of evidence now to show that power balance is really no more beneficial than a rubber band, do you think they'll continue to wear them? I had a patient last week uh, come in who works at a chemist and uh, was telling me that um, somebody came in after we'd actually been on the news reporting these uh, um, results. And said, uh, oh, I don't care what they say, I'm, I'm going to get one anyway, and actually bought one. And um, and it sort of struck me that uh, people in the general population don't tend to worry too much about that sort of stuff, uh, whether it's proven or not. There are some that are going to believe regardless, there are some that are going to be sceptical regardless. Um, having said that, the athlete side of things, uh, we did actually have contact last year with a uh, an agent for somebody, uh, for a few athletes, wanting to know the results beforehand so they could tell their athletes to stop using them if they didn't work so that they didn't look too foolish when the results were released. Mm. So I think they are mindful of that sort of stuff, but again, it probably depends on how high profile they are. The average amateur footballer or basketballer you know, probably couldn't care less, and if they feel they're getting an advantage, then let them go. Um, we're, we're more worried about our patients and, and having appropriate diagnosis delayed, etc. Well, interestingly, Djokovic was wearing one in the um, tennis a couple of nights ago and won. So obviously that was because of the power balance band. Of obviously. course. Not because course. they're a very good tennis player or anything to do with their skills. It no, was the right. band. <laughs> so, well, look, we'll just have to see how he goes in the final, I suppose. And, um, you know, because if he loses, it may be because the band was on the wrong wrist or... Upside down you know, or... I don't yeah, know. upside down. <laughs> you know, we, we have had one group um, contact us claiming that um, you should be using it on the left side and not the right uh, because the, uh, that's apparently where energy enters the body. Right. Um, which is, yeah, it's the first I've heard of it, but, um, you know, again, who knows? So one of the really interesting things that you've just mentioned to me is that, um, I mean, a lot of people would say, well, if it's placebo, the placebo effect is a real effect, therefore it works. But you're saying that you didn't even find a placebo effect with these bands. That's something right. really interesting. Yeah, definitely. At least from the quantitative measures that we did, uh, we didn't see any placebo effect at all. Um, so I suppose that means if there's a, a real-world effect, then um, what we what we think is happening is that, uh, yes, it's either a placebo effect, so it's a perception of improvement, not necessarily an actual improvement, or uh, like anything else, people the more they do uh, physical activity, so for example, they put one on and keep playing golf, they're just practicing golf more, so they're getting better because they're practicing and, and doing it more. Uh, it's, it's probably how we think it works. So just a final final question, Simon. Why do you think then this product has been so successful? Because since 2007, uh, these two guys have sold more than 3 million units of these things. Uh, and I've seen them myself. We also have, as you've just heard, a placebo band, which is made in the same company for about $2. And the power balance band sell for up to $60 here. Why do you think it's so successful? Uh, I think it's... Um Great marketing, uh, terrific endorsements from uh, well-known athletes. Is uh, certainly nothing to be sneezed at when you're trying to market something to athletes, both amateur and professional. And um, it's pretty, you know, it's kind of groovy looking, and people like a trend. I suppose mm. <laughs> it's the best I can say. Yeah. Um, the other thing from a, from a clinical aspect is that uh, what we're seeing is that um, people want a quick fix. You know, so rather than going through weeks of uh, vestibular rehabilitative therapy, they want to put a band on and get better balance. You know, just like people like to take a pill and have mm. the disease go away or, or what have you. So, uh, yeah, people, it, it's, you know, a little bit of both. People want that edge, they'll do anything to get it, um, and also uh, there's the trend aspect and, and the want for quick fix. 
Okay, so Simon, obviously your publication is currently in press uh, in the Journal of Body Work and Movement Therapies. When do you expect it will be published? We're hoping it will be in the next issue, which will be in April, although we've just, uh, we're just finished reviewing uh, the article at the moment. So um, it's up to them, I suppose, hopefully April. Okay, so in the meantime, how can our listeners find out more about this particular study or more about the research that you're doing? Uh, they can just get onto RMIT's website, that's uh, rmit.edu.au, or um, contact RMIT Media and they can uh, issue press release or you can get in contact with me directly through RMIT Media as well. All right, well, thanks very much, Dr. Simon Bryce, for joining us today on The Skeptic Zone. Thank you. Now I have a few more snippets, just in case you haven't had enough of power balance just yet, and well, I think we've all had enough, but anyway. If you're interested in following the lawsuit against power balance, you can go to http colon slash slash www.powerbalanceclassaction.com. Oh, what a sweet URL that is. Power Balance Class Action. Dot com. Also, we noticed that the New Zealand Prime Minister, John Key... Hello, everybody listening in New Zealand. I'm sorry your Prime Minister's uh, doing this. ...was photographed wearing a power balance wristband. What? He's been taken to task by the New Zealand media at the moment, and so he should. Goodness me. I've come across the website of another interesting product, which looks very much like power balance called improvebalancebands.com yes or at improvebalance on twitter and they are very closely following what power balance do as in their advertising and their promotional blurbs in fact the promotional blurbs on improvebalancebands.com is verbatim from power balance who is copying whom i wonder And finally, I will leave you with the words of Melbourne chiropractor Dr. Matt Bateman, who, uh, last year at any rate, was a fan of power balance wristbands. Melbourne chiropractor Dr. Matt Bateman has tried it on hundreds of his patients, even staking his reputation on it. It can increase strength, balance, stability and core power, so and flexibility as well. So there's a lot of things it can actually do. Hold. Now, do you feel stronger? Okay, it's, I'm putting a lot more pressure in there. There's only so much you can fake. I'm not faking uh, 500% increased strength and stability, which is what I felt when I first did the test. I can't fake that. Hey, Brew. Oh, hey, Brew. What? On your wrist? Is that a balanced power band? What the? No, no, no. This is a placebo band. A what? That's right. New from skepticbrews.com. Placebo Band. No more popping pills, painful needles, or smelly ointments. Huh? Placebo Band uses two powerful, scientifically proven effects, the placebo effect and confirmation bias. Seriously, there's no one else here. Who are you yelling at? Placebo Bands in five fashionable colours are available for only $2 each, plus postage and handling, from skepticbros.com. Get yours today! Why do I even talk to you? I'm your brother, and Mum says you have to. Ugh. <sighs> Here's Maynard's spooky action at a distance. I've investigated some pretty stupid things in my time, but one of the most stupid things that's come to uh, my notice recently from overseas podcasts, um, Adam Curry has covered it extensively, is um, the big vodka eyeball shot fiasco. This is where people, usually young people, are doing vodka shots into their eye. Who would do that? I don't know. I've seen pretty stupid, stupid people doing it. So I've come to an eye optometrist here in Emsley. Hi, Ian. How are you? Good, thanks very much. How are you? Drinking vodka can be dangerous enough without pouring it into your eye. Oh, exactly. Yeah, it's uh, 40% alcohol, as you know. Uh, vodka's been used as disinfectant. Yeah, what are you going to do, pour disinfectant into your eye? I mean, it's a very, very stupid thing to do. Now, the idea is that it actually gets you drunk faster because there's uh, blood vessels in your eyes that can absorb the vodka faster than it can through your stomach. From a man who is 
A, a drinker, B, an optometrist. What's your <laughs> professional opinion on this idea? Oh, totally false. I mean, there might be some very, very minimal absorption, but it'd be incredibly tiny compared to what the stomach and especially the small intestine can do. So, so go through what would happen if you poured something like vodka or any alcohol directly into your eye. Uh, most of it would spill out for a start because the eye can really only hold one drop, maybe even two, but may- a one drop. But most of it would just pour straight out. All you're going to really get in there is one drop for a little while, and it's, it's just going to be very uh, irritating to the to the conjunctiva, the membranes, the delicate membranes around over the white part of the eye and the inside of the lid. What damage to the vision can you expect? Probably it'll be a little bit of swelling maybe the next day. So it could be a little bit blurry for, with swelling of the cornea, which is the clear uh, membrane over the front of the eye. And so there could be a little bit blur in the, in the next day. But it, repeated exposures, yeah, would, uh, would certainly cause some big problems. And in these videos, we see the people doing it, and the idea is that they get more drunk. But we've never seen someone go from a sober state doing it. So your theory that you mentioned to me when I rang you about this was, in fact, they're just drunk in the first place, and this really isn't adding anything to it. And also, there's an inflammatory effect you were mentioning that happens that might block the whole alcohol absorption anyway. Yeah, it's totally impossible. You can't go from sober to being very quickly drunk by pouring vodka in your eye. It's just not going to happen. It will not happen. Uh, You're far better to to have a a lot of um, vodka or alcohol on an empty stomach. That's the quick way to do it. And that's the way people have been doing it for years, actually. (laughs) Tried and true method, Mm. yeah, Yeah. for sure. You mentioned that inflammatory response, so when the alcohol hits the eye, what does the eye do? It immediately sets up a a reaction against the toxicity, the chemical reaction that goes against the the tissue. And so you get a lot of blood vessel response to try and clear up whatever's uh, causing the irritation. So you get a lot of swelling, fluid swelling to protect itself and a lot of blood vessel activity going on. And there's also possible burning of the cornea or the clear part, which is incredibly painful because it's the most sensitive part of the body. It's got the most pain nerve endings anywhere in the body. So there'll be a lot of reactions going on with that stuff. So as an eye care professional, why? Why do you think people are pouring something as stupid as that in their eye? <laughs> uh, in my theory, it's purely risk-taking. It's uh, you know, it's a way of saying, "Look at me! Look at how you know uh, how, how brave I am! I'm pouring vodka directly into my uh, my eye." You know, it's young men. Maybe some women do it, but yeah, it's me. I'm a risk taker. Look at me, how sexy I am. <laughs> and, and what would your message be to anyone who was even thinking that? Although it should be obvious, uh, definitely don't do it. Obviously, <laughs> but you could. I mean, why haven't they poured it into their ear? I mean, would you pour vodka into your ear? I mean, that's that's pretty close to the brain. So uh, give that a go. I, I don't think so. <laughs> well, it's a bit like saying, look, I, I want a sugar hit. You know, I, I'm feeling a little bit run down. I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll put a um, Mars bar in my eye. Now, would you put a Mars bar in your eye if you wanted a sugar hit? Of course you wouldn't. <laughs> Pretty stupid. Hi. This is Michael Cruz from the Committee for the Advancement of Scientific Skepticism at the Centre for Inquiry Canada. CAS is committed to critically examining scientific, technological and medical claims in the public forum across Canada. Working with our expert advisors, local CFI branches and other sceptical groups, CAS confronts the peddlers of pseudoscience with evidence-based scientific inquiry. 2010 has been a watershed year for the sceptical movement in Canada and in 2011 CAS will continue fighting bad science in the media and the government. If you would like to become involved in the fight to promote critical thinking in Canada, or if you have a concern about the spread of pseudoscience in the Canadian media, please contact us at CAS at cficanada.ca. You can also follow us on Twitter at CFICAS and on Facebook at CAS at Centre for Inquiry Canada. CAS, fighting pseudoscience without apology. And joining me on Skype now, I think I've got practically half of Melbourne. In fact, it's the Melbourne Skeptics. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 You see, I've got half of Melbourne on the line right now. <laughs> Let's kick off with uh, Chris Higgins. Hi, Chris. Hey, Richard. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's a bit hot in Sydney, and it's a hot and down in Melbourne, as I understand at the moment. It's very, very warm. It's very warm all over the place. We have Ed. Hello, Ed. Hello. How are we going? We're going well. And Ilias, Hi. Hello, how's you going? Good. Apart from roasting. And roasting, of course. I'm fine. Karen? Greetings. Greetings. Now, you're speaking to us from your headphones, aren't you? Uh, I am indeed, yes. A creative lot, these Melbourne people. We've got, we've got Lucas Randall. Hi, Lucas. Hello, Richard. How are you? Fine, fine. And Matthew? Hi, Richard. 
Yep, everyone's here, including our favourite from the Melbourne Think Tank a couple of weeks ago. It's Posty Lindley. Hooray! 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 Good, Lindley. Good, Lindley. I've got another vodka drink too. Who <laughs> seems to have lots of voices. That's, that's quite clever. <laughs> okay, let's kick off with you, Chris. Can you fill us in a little bit about uh, what this Melbourne Skeptics is all about and uh, your first big night? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. The, the idea, I had the idea. I mean, obviously, it's not, it's not my idea, but I thought before Tam it would be really cool to, to get a Melbourne Skeptics in the pub happening because um, we haven't had one in Melbourne for... Um, since before I was born. That's not true. Um, and I spoke to uh, our good friend Travis Roy from the Granite State Skeptics, um, who I met in, in, in Vegas, and he gave me some really good advice on sort of firing stuff up, and, and that was pretty much it. I picked a venue, put it on Facebook, and said, if you want to come along, this is when we're doing it, and, uh, and it was a, a massive success, um, So, which is really cool. So all the other people there, uh, Ed, for example, you, you came along uh, just to check it out? Yeah, basically. I had a great time at, uh, at uh, TAM and really thought that this was the best thing to do because there's so many like-minded people and a great chance to talk about things that maybe with some of my other friends I can't really talk about, your astrology and that where people are all a little bit um, you know, touchy about. Here I can actually let loose and we had a great time, lots of good food, good drinks, Awesome people. That sounds too good to be true. I'm sorry I missed it now. I really am. I, lo- I, love, I love going to the, these events. Now let's uh, move on and uh, we'll chat with uh, Ilias. What's your connection, Ilias, with all of this? Well, I've basically been following the Skeptics movement for a couple of years now and sort of gotten involved on the internet mainly with um, the lobby against the Australian anti-vaccination group. Yeah, so, you know, I've been pretty pretty solidly involved with the Stop the AVN uh, Facebook webpage, apart from, you know, doing a little bit of campaigning on Twitter. So, for me, I've always been into, always wanted to have something that was more local uh, with Melbourne. Like, it's nice to have the Australian sceptics and then the Victoria, Victoria sceptics, which is the arm of that. But then this was just for us, and it makes it feel more accessible when it's local. So that's how I, I, when I saw it, I went, oh, great. Like, this is just our little sort of cup of tea. And oh, I just wanted to get into it straight away. Does that answer your question? <laughs> it does. It, absolutely. Because this is something we, we really encourage. We, uh, we're delighted when people sort of, well, more or less spontaneously decide to get together and call themselves the local skeptic yeah. group. Because um, you can always tap into uh, the greater what shall we say, the greater oort cloud of scepticism mm. out there with, with uh, contacts, especially a one, Chris Higgins, who has a very special contact, of course, a, 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 a good contact with James Randi, yeah, as our yeah. listeners would have known from a few weeks ago, is uh, Chris was uh, James Randi's uh, assistant That's in Australia. That's very true, very, very true, and I've been, uh, it's given me enormous bragging rights ever since, Tam. Yeah, don't we know it? <laughs> <You're> so jealous. <laughs> and for the rest of your life, no doubt. Indeed. Now, uh, uh, Karen, on speaking through a headphone. Hello. Were you a Tam, Karen? Yes, I, Tam? I, I certainly was. Um, and were you involved in the skeptics before then? Forgive me if I don't know. Uh, not really. Um, I've been uh, a spectator in the skeptical movement for uh, for a while, but uh, before Tam, I was um, quite inactive, and it. Uh, um, showed me what, what's around, what I can actually do. And, uh, yeah, that was uh, good, good to expand my horizons in that respect. Well, we're delighted that someone like you who has had an interest and then uh, bothered or, or made the big effort, I should say, to come to TAM Australia is now hooking up locally which is exactly the sort of thing we'd love to see and love to encourage. Now, I don't need to... Uh, tell our listeners who Lucas Randall is. Lucas, well, I will, but Lucas is the man who gave the Skeptic Zone, donated to the Skeptic Zone, a wonderful uh, Canon video camera, which is uh, being put to very good use, busting people all around the world. Lucas, I know that you have a very great interest in skepticism, so it must be good for you to uh, hook up with a local group like this. Yes, definitely, Richard. Uh, as you know, I uh, am also starting another Skeptics in the Pub group, and there's, there's, there's actually three new ones, including the Melbourne Skeptics, um, the uh, Melbourne Skeptics in the Pub, the Eastern Hill Skeptics in the Pub, and the Great Ocean Road Skeptics in the Pub that it's just starting up next, next month as well. It reminds me of the old Australian joke There's a, a, the country town. There's a pub on every corner and one in the middle in case you get thirsty going from one pub to the other. <laughs> what a great idea. 
<laughs> now, <laughs> now, Matthew, what's your connection to all of this? Um, well, I've been involved in the skeptical movement for a couple of years, I guess. It started out like a lot of people listening to podcasts such as The Skeptic Zone and uh, mm. a lot of the American ones, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. And I started going along to the um, the Victorian skeptics who have a, a monthly sort of skeptics cafe, which is uh, a little more formal with a dinner and a, a talk usually each month. Um, and so this uh, this Melbourne skeptics meetup has just been fantastic. It's a bit more informal and it's just a sort of a traditional skeptics in the pub kind of thing, which is great. Which has been very successful here in Sydney for uh, I, I seem to remember six or seven years now, probably about six years. Uh, wow. Really successful for getting people together in sydney and we've made some great new friends let me tell you sorry great uh, new skeptics sorry richard has it really been going the, going on for that long yeah wow yeah the, the 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 funny thing is that uh well i i was the founder of skeptics in the pub in sydney and yeah. i'm trying to scratch through records and think to, to find out when i actually started it but i'm i'm might be with guessing, a tab, and, and, but <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> i'm guessing it's about six years ago something like that wow. time flies Time really flies. Uh, but another person, of course, known to our audience from a few weeks ago, Posty Lindley. Posty Lindley was at TAM, of course, mm -hmm. and she joined us for the Melbourne Think Tank a few weeks ago. It must have been really fun for you to go along to the uh, to the first um, Skeptics in the Pub. Yeah, I got to get out of the house and not have to go to work for once, <laughs> which was... <laughs> But um, no, to go out and actually meet people and um, finally have a, a, a meet up at a pub. The other one's usually at a cafe, and that's quite good. I agree. I think a pub's better than a cafe. Uh, not because you can drink the alcohol, but it's a different atmosphere, I think you'd have to say. The alcohol helps. That's that's great. And you're a real postie, aren't you? You really deliver letters and parcels to people. Yeah, and in this heat, I've already passed out once. Uh, oh, no. It's not fun. No. I was rushing to to get a Slurpee yesterday, and they've got a wild berry Slurpee, so I was excited. They so. are so good. Yeah, that oh, is. Oh, <laughs> Where's mine? <laughs> that and the, Did um, you pass out on the posty bike? Yeah, pretty much. I was delivering, and it was just too too much heat, too, heat exhaustion. It was yeah. just, Were uh, you delivering Slurpees? No, <laughs> I'd love to deliver Slurpees. <laughs> one of those, <laughs> one of those dads, 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 awesome. Dads. <laughs> Can you deliver a Slurpee to me? I wouldn't mind <laughs> one right That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, all Slurpees all round. Thank you. Now, what, what's the, so what was the order of events at this very first meeting at the pub? And which pub was it, by the way, for our listeners? Uh, it was at the James Squire Brew House, which is uh, in Docklands. If you, if you don't know Melbourne, there's kind of a, a waterfront area that was built, you know, sort of a few years ago. And it's this massive multi-million dollar facility. And it turns out that no one goes there. Um, I was there last Friday afternoon and there's just no one around. Um, but there's this great pub, uh, which is a couple. There's one in, uh, I believe, there's one in in Sydney as well, the James Squire Brew House, uh, and oh, of yes, course James yes. Squire make all their beer that uh, is sold around Australia. But they have a, a sort of a few venues as well, and um, uh, there's there's two specific ones in Melbourne, and this is the uh, the newer of the two. So it's just been renovated, just been decked out. Fantastic view of the water and uh, the sort of waterfront city area. Um, really, really fantastic, and it was I mean, it was practically empty when we were there. So I think the uh, the manager was impressed that we managed to drag forty people in there who all had a, a feed and half a dozen drinks each. I think he was pretty stoked. Oh, the food was great too. Hopefully, that means we can use the venue again. Exactly, it was, it's a great venue for it. So, what's the idea with the the skeptics in the pub down there? Really, is it just a chance for people to get together and socialise, or? Do you think you might, as we do in Sydney now, have a, uh, a speaker every month? Um, look, it's definitely a possibility. I, I mean, I, I'm quite keen to leave it really, really open to, to sort of people can have whatever they want. And I said that to everyone last night, uh, sorry, the night before, um, that, that you know, you, you guys tell me what you want and, and I'll sort of um, put it together. If you want to have a speaker every month, we can do that. You know, if there's someone famous in town like, I don't know, Dr. Rachie maybe, hint, hint, um, we can do that. But <laughs> yeah. otherwise, it'll just be a, a social occasion. Oh, now that's a good idea. I think we should uh, organise for uh, Dr. Rachie to fly down and uh, do a, a talk at one of your sceptics in the pub. I think she'd be a big hit. Yay! Woohoo! Oh, God. I'm the lone voice here. I'll just shut up now. <laughs> well, I think. <laughs> Edit that out. Cut. There, is always, there is already the sort of the formal thing with uh, the Victorian sceptics, I think, do that. Uh, they have a speaker each month or, or whatever, um, which is also very good. 
I think I like the idea of having the informal thing, which is, like I tweeted beforehand, it was like TAM, but without the lectures and the speakers and workshops oh, and that. Right, right. Now, I think what you people are doing is is really inspiring people all around the world who are hearing this to think to themselves, well, why don't we have a skeptics in the pub? How hard was it, Chris, to put all this together? Uh, it was not hard at all. It, it was literally just a case of putting up a Facebook event, um, putting up a website. I mean, I'm a web designer anyway, so that, that bit was easy. Um, and, yeah, 40 people turned up. You know, the only people that I really knew beforehand were, were Matt, Lindley, and Lucas, uh, there's a few other faces I recognise, but apart from that, everyone just turned up from word of mouth, which was great. And, and can, can I jump in? And word of Twitter, of course. Mm-hmm. Oh, of yeah, course, yeah, for Twitter as well. Yay for Twitter. You know, the, you know what the amazing thing was? Yeah. On the night, um, there was only about 24 people who actually responded to the Facebook event. But on the night, quite a few people that I'd spoken to said, oh, you know, I'm on Twitter, and I saw so-and-so was going to this, and I thought, oh, you know, might be worth checking out, and I'm having a great time, da-da-da-da. So it wasn't necessarily people who saw it by Facebook, and it's just tying back into what, Kieran? Was it Kieran who said about Twitter? Yeah, yes, it was. Ah, oh, I've got it right. Um, <laughs> it just tying back in with how powerful Twitter is as as, as a medium for disseminating all that information. If you put it on Twitter, everyone will see it and it will get passed on. So I reckon that really works. I reckon that almost doubled the number. I agree. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. Yes, I, I, I can't help but agree with you. And, of course, the Twitter that everybody listening to the Skeptic Zone, especially those in Melbourne and Victoria, should add to their list is at Melb Skeptics. And of the website that everybody in Victoria and Melbourne should run and bookmark straight away is melbourneskeptics.com.au, spelt the uh, the sceptical way. With a K. <laughs> oh, you made it sound like <laughs> Yeah, the shameless cross-promotion there. There's a Facebook page as well, which is just facebook.com slash melbourneskeptics. That's great. Now, when's the next time? When's the next time we can rush down to Melbourne, rush to the pub, and uh, have a few cold ones with you? Yeah, Chris, when's the next one? Come We're on, Chris, when's the next one? Yeah, tell February us, February 28th. Uh, the next, yeah, okay, I'm on to it. So the 28th of February, the event's going to happen on the fourth Monday of every month. Um, so, yeah, the 28th next month, and all the dates are up on the website. If you go to the Skeptics in the Pub page on the Melbourne Skeptics website, you can see all the dates for 2011. Yep. And if you're too if you're too keen to wait for that, of course, the uh, Melbourne Eastern Hills Skeptics in the Pub begins on the fifteenth of February, Yay. and then we'll be meeting on the second Monday of every month out at uh, at Knoxfield. I think our goal is to have a Skeptics in the Pub every night of the week somewhere. But you must come to this one because they serve a big farmer palmer. Oh yeah, you... Lindley, uh, gonna Lindley posted it. a picture of me eating my big farmer palmer. I'm a big so, farmer shill. Yep, <laughs> palmer shill. Even Steve Roberts had a, his oh, big farmer Palmer too. He did, yes. Now, Lin- Lindley, for those people listening over, overseas, can you explain a big farmer Palmer? Oh, it had um, <laughs> a Palmer. It was a chicken, chicken big, chicken with cheese and sauce with uh, bacon and eggs on top, I think it was. It was yep. absolutely enormous. It was huge. It, it was like a, 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 the, the full foghorn leghorn chicken. Yeah, it looked quite tasty too. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Well, look, don't be surprised if half the Skeptic Zone now come down for your next meeting. That's all we want. Noms. We're going to need a bigger pub. We're going to need, yes, that's right. I'm sure Dr. Rachie is is, um, is, uh, most interested to visit your pub now to give a talk and maybe have a try the big Palmer. The big Farmer Palmer. Lovely. But listen, uh, thank you all very much for uh, jumping on Skype with me. Uh, everybody in Melbourne, if you're of a sceptical mind, this is the place for you to be. A great opportunity to meet like-minded people, have a big farmer palmer, a couple of beers, and a really good time. So, Melb Skeptics, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. 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 Thank you very much, Richard. Bye. Ciao. Hey, you skeptics, I have something to share with you. I've got something that's going to get all you soft dicks to stop ignoring the truth that's right in front of your faces. This is an EVP I recorded last night. There was no one else around, no other electronic equipment, no other explanation. This was a voice from beyond the grave. Listen up. Did you hear it? Here. Let me slow it down. 
even slower. Slower. Hey, how you doing? I'm a ghost. I have unfinished business. What's up? You guys can't possibly ignore that type of... Hey, who are you? What are you doing in my... Hey, gang. I'm sorry, but there are no spirits trying to contact you. EVPs are the result of pareidolia and cross-modulation combined with the listener's hopes and expectations. Do that. And since when the hell can you use the unknown to prove the unknown? What does this have to do with science? I think you just got skeptically pwned. Well, gotta go. See you in hell. Six, six, six. Uh... SkepticallyPwned.com Where false claims get kicked in the nuts. <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. I found Maynard's interview this week very disturbing, I must say. And congratulations to those Melbourne skeptics for a, such a, a great initiative, and I hope to visit. In fact, I think the whole Skeptic Zone team will have to uh, make sure we go down and visit you guys in Melbourne at your Melbourne Skeptics in the pub. Airfares are pretty cheap these days, I think. Yeah, sounds good to me. Now, in the past week, past couple of weeks, I've really seen how Skeptic Zone fans can leap into action. First of all, I want to thank everybody who contributed to the new microphone for Dr. Rachie. And a big thank you to listener Trevor Lowe, who contributed uh, quite a a decent amount. All of your efforts combined mean that the new microphone for Dr. Rachie is on the way as I speak. Fantastic. She can't wait to get it, and I'm sure her Dr. Rachie Reports segments will sound even better than they did before, if that's possible. Also, thank you to all the listeners who wrote in with your comments about our interview last week, Maynard's interview with Jessica Adams, the astrologer. I really didn't need to say anything at all. You people, you know your arguments, you know your logical fallacies, your contradictions, your pleas to authority and all the rest of it. If you want to see what other people said or thought about the uh, interview with Jessica Adams and her points of view about astrology, defending astrology, head to www.skepticzone.tv And click the comments link for episode 119. It makes for fascinating reading. Oh yes, I almost forgot. Happy birthday, Stefan Soika. So, until next week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from the middle of a heat wave here in Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts, and extra video reports.